Our next speaker, Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. Mr. Vilsack is the uh, nation's 30th Secretary of Agriculture. Prior to, to his appointment as Secretary, Mr. Vilsack served two terms as the Governor of Iowa, in the Iowa State Senate and as the Mayor of Mount Pleasant, Iowa. He is a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Senator Vilsack was born into an orphanage and adopted in 1951. After graduating Hamilton College and Albany Law School in New York, he moved to Mount Pleasant, his wife Christie's hometown, where he practiced law. The Vilsacks have two adult sons and two daughters-in-law. And you heard from Mr. Vilsack at our last conference. And he addressed the issue of rural housing, which is, of course, what our conferences are about. But this morning, he's going to address a different issue. He's going to talk about the opioid crisis, a crisis that's hitting many rural communities around this country. Mr. Vilsack has become something of a champion. He's appeared at press conferences and other events and has been sounding the alarm and been talking about addressing this issue and addressing it seriously. So we're glad that he's here. And, and what we'll do is, again, you know, there's pads in your, on your desks. If you have questions, please, you know, the, the staff will be walking around. And he's agreed to take some questions. I'll read them to him and uh, give him a chance to answer them. So please welcome Secretary Vilsack. Well, good morning, folks. I uh, had decided to start my uh, presentation this morning with a series of numbers uh, in the hopes that I would catch you a bit by surprise. But uh, the great introduction that I just received sort of let the cat out of the bag in terms of what I'm going to speak to you about. Uh, let me first and foremost thank you uh, for what you do every single day uh, in the housing area. Uh, I know that you all have worked closely with Tony Hernandez and our, our team at USDA uh, to try to expand opportunities for housing, good housing, decent housing, affordable housing in rural communities. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't start by acknowledging the great work that you're doing uh, and thanking you for the work that you've done over the last eight years with this administration in expanding opportunity. I'm proud of the fact that we have seen uh, well over uh, a million families uh, receive assistance and help uh, through our loan programs and uh, thousands of families uh, have received uh, assistance through our self-help program and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of families have benefited from our multifamily assistance. But we couldn't do any of that without the incredible advocates that are in this room. So first and foremost, thank you uh, for what you're doing. You know, we're a country that cares. And today, there are 21 million of our citizens who are suffering from a substance use disorder. Many of those individuals uh, began their journey in addiction through an innocent usage of pain medications prescribed in all probability by a physician. Uh, since 19, uh, the early 1990s, uh, opioids have been introduced as a pain management technique in the country. Uh, and we have now see over 250 million prescriptions for opioids uh, issued every single year in this country. The physicians were told uh, this was the miracle drug. This was the drug that was going to allow us to deal with chronic pain without the risk of addiction. Well, it turns out that was wrong. Today, over 10 million of our citizens are misusing opioids uh, for purposes other than pain management, and 2 million of them are addicted, and many of them have turned from opioids to heroin because heroin is less expensive and more easily obtainable. So it's a crisis of epic proportions and the reality is it's a costly crisis. You know as we deal, uh, and you all have certainly felt this, as we deal with constrained budgets and difficult choices in terms of priorities and budgets, it's unfortunate that in today's America we spend almost 80 billion dollars of lost productivity or unnecessary health care costs because of this crisis. But the real tragedy is the fact that over 28,000 of our friends and neighbors have died. The last year that we have statistics for deaths is 2014, and it was in excess of 28,000, which is more people dying from opioid and heroin use than automobile accidents. So there's a human cost, and there's a financial cost to this crisis. 
Now, the President called me into his office uh, about a year ago and asked if I would consider taking this on as an additional responsibility in addition to the responsibilities I had at USDA because he was concerned that mortality rates in rural areas were rising, especially for white males, far, far beyond what we see globally. So I began to look at this and it occurred to me that we needed a strategy. Uh, we needed a cohesive, co comprehensive strategy to deal with this and it first and foremost starts with prevention. Uh, making sure that we actually look at the ways in which these opioids are prescribed and maybe narrow the time and the circumstances under which they're used and the CDC has responded with a new set of guidelines. That requires us to retrain our physicians and our healthcare pra uh, practitioners in terms of when and under what appropriate limited purposes opioids are, uh, should be utilized. And we're in that process of working to retrain literally hundreds of thousands of physicians across the United States. In addition, we want to make sure the next generation of healthcare providers are, are not working under the misapprehension or misunderstanding that these opioids are not addictive. So we've begun partnering uh, during this administration with over 100 medical schools, nursing schools, and pharmacy schools to make sure that the next generation of healthcare providers are well educated and understand the risk that's associated. The FDA is now putting a warning uh, label on uh, the pill bottles. And physicians and dentists are looking at ways in which they can really, really restrict the number of pills that are, in fact, being prescribed. And we're seeing, fortunately, a decline in prescriptions. As part of our prevention strategy, we want to make sure that first responders, especially in small towns, are equipped with reversal drugs because, unfortunately and tragically, there are far too many circumstances of overdose that could result in death but could be prevented if first responders have naloxone or Narcan. And so we're seeing an expanded opportunity to access that drug, making sure that the costs of that drug don't go up uh, astronomically because of the increased demand. And so we are again seeing uh, significant increases in the prescribing of naloxone, the availability of naloxone, and hopefully over time that's going to save lives. So prevention is critically important. Treatment is incredibly important, but it has to be comprehensive. Uh, you have to just not simply provide one drug to substitute for another uh, under a medicated-assisted treatment regimen. You've got to surround that with counseling and guidance and, and assistance and support from the community. So we have utilized resources, although they've been somewhat limited, to expand the number of clinics and areas where people can obtain medication-assisted treatment. And recently, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has expanded the number of individuals who can pres prescribe and provide this assisted treatment and also the number of people those individuals can treat. There was a limitation, 100 a year, it's now up to 275 a year. And we're looking at certain pilot uh, efforts uh, to expand the ability of some nurse practitioners, uh, nurse uh, 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 physician assistants to be able to utilize uh, the medication assisted treatment protocols to provide help and assistance in remote areas. USDA has been engaged in this effort as well by using our community facility program to expand access to clinics to help fund and facilitate the development of clinics across rural America. And we've utilized our telemedicine grant program to try to provide the assistance and help for local, regional, rural clinics to be able to access the consultants and experts in tertiary care centers. So all of that's ongoing. But there is a critical need for additional resources. And now, uh, last night, the House of Representatives, in a very strong bipartisan vote, uh, passed the American Cures Bill, the 21st Century Cures Bill. And that bill not only deals with uh, the cancer moonshot that Vice President Biden has been focused on, the, the brain initiative that President Obama uh, initially uh, announced, but also includes resources to expand treatment, significant resources to expand treatment. Uh, it now goes to the Senate, where hopefully uh, it will be voted on uh, next week. And we all have a voice we can use uh, at this critical time, because those resources could potentially expand by hundreds, if not thousands, the locations where uh, assisted treatment can be provided. So treatment is incredibly important. Criminal justice reform is part of this strategy, and you may wonder wh why that is so. Well, the reality is that when people are uh, addicted, they often make mistakes. Uh, they are searching for the resources to be able to continue to feed the habit. They sometimes violate the law, they get caught, they get into the criminal justice system, 
at a time what they really need is the public health system. They need to be redirected from jail into treatment. But the reality is if we have drug courts and if we have redirected uh, opportunities, uh, these folks have to live someplace. And that's where we come in to play. They have to figure out ways in which we can work with our housing programs to provide transitional housing. And I know that we're all engaged, involved in permanent housing, but for some folks, that transitional housing may be the key. Uh, the ability to aggregate numbers of people who are in drug courts so that the probation officers and the, uh, the, uh, the counselors and so forth don't have to travel in multiple places, but can provide uh, the guidance and the direction uh, to a group of folks. So what we've done at USDA in an effort to try to help with the criminal justice reform is we've looked at our housing programs, we've looked at our housing stock. You know, every once in a while folks can't make the payment on a loan that we've provided. It becomes a real estate that we now own, USDA owns. And instead of trying to turn that over very quickly, uh, we're working with treatment uh, facilities in a number of states to, to ask the question, what if we provided this opportunity for you to purchase this home on contract for the first couple of years, all you have to do is pay you know, insurance and taxes, see if it makes a difference for folks. And if it does, then we'll sell it to you at a discounted price. Uh, because th that's a way of using that housing stock uh, in, a, in, a, in a positive way. And maybe then what happens is individual families who use that home uh, ultimately decide that that's something that uh, they'd like to be able to purchase permanently. Uh, and you provide hope and assistance to folks. So, Criminal justice reform combined with uh, an assistance uh, in terms of housing, critically important to the strategy. Providing a, a, a community of, of recovery is what I refer to it as. It's a, a community, particularly in rural areas. You know, folks in rural areas, as you well know, they're self-reliant, they're independent, they don't necessarily want their neighbors to know everything about them. And so they're, it's reluctant. There's a reluctance to talk about addiction. And we still harbor in this country the unfortunate stereotype that folks who are addicted are bad people. Folks who are addicted are, have character flaws. Folks that are addicted are weak. It's not the case. Folks who are suffering from addiction are dealing with a disease, just in the same way that our friends and neighbors are dealing with cancer or diabetes or any other disease. If I came to you today and I explained to you that in my family I've got two boys, um, that one of my boys was suffering from cancer, you would probably express great sympathy. You'd probably want to figure out, is there something we can do to help you? That would be the reaction in the rural communities. But if I said to you, my son is addicted, what would your reaction be? Would it be judgmental? Well, we know that some of our friends and neighbors would be judgmental, and, and that's a problem because it makes it more difficult for people to be open about their challenge, for families to recognize the telltale signs of addiction and to be able to try to provide help and assistance. So we are trying to create a community of support where we can have those conversations, where we're asking our faith-based uh, institutions uh, and, and other community-supported institutions to be able to create a, a, a space where these kinds of conversations can take place more easily and more frequently. Maybe it's the basement of a church. Maybe it's a community action facility where people can congregate and gather and talk, share stories, get help and assistance. Again, you all as advocates and leaders in your community can help provide that community of support and recovery. And finally, there's an economic aspect to this. And the reality is in rural communities, if your tomorrow is not going to be any better than today, maybe you are tempted to continue down that road of addiction to get relief from the anxiety and stress that you feel because of your economic circumstances. Maybe you're a young person who can't find a job. Maybe you've had a job and lost a job because of plants moved. Or, or, or maybe it's a circumstance and situation in which uh, you just, uh, you're 50 years old and you've just been laid off. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of stress in there, and that's why we have been using our economic development programs to create a new strategy to revitalize and rebuild the rural economy uh, that's based in part on production agriculture and exports, local and regional food systems, conservation and ecosystem markets, and a bio-based manufacturing economy. And we're beginning to see good signs with reduced unemployment, with reduced poverty, and reduced food insecurity among families in rural areas. That has to continue. So there, there's a comprehensive approach to this problem. Now let me finish before I take questions. And I, I, didn't, I said I'd take questions, I didn't say I'd answer them. So let's just be clear about that. 
this is personal. And my guess is it's personal for a lot of people in this room. 44% of Americans have indicated to the Kaiser Foundation that they know someone who is addicted to prescription drugs. I knew someone, my mom. Started out life in an orphanage, adopted into a family. My mom went into a hospital uh, when I was nine or 10 years of age, uh, had a surgery, uh, was given pain medication, came out of that hospital, not the same person that went in that hospital. Over the course of the next five or six years, my mom had a downward spiral to her life. There were times, weeks on end, uh, when she would leave the family, go up to the attic of our home, and drink herself into a stupor. Several times she was so despondent she tried to take her life. And I remember very vividly one time when I was awakened in the middle of the night by voices of my grandmother and my dad trying to keep my mom awake long enough for the ambulance to come because she had swallowed a number of sleeping pills. She was addicted to pain medications and alcohol. December 25th, 1963, she was on a train to her brother's house, drunk. And at that point in time, something happened, and she decided that it couldn't get any worse, that she had to take action. Fortunately for my mom, she was surrounded by what I've just talked about. She had access to long, uh, a long treatment plan. She had a, a return to a community that was supportive, multiple AA meetings, many sponsors, many supportive family members. And over time, she got her life back together again. And over the last 14 years of her life before she died from cancer, my mom was sober. My mom provided an incredible example of resilience, uh, a credible example of courage, an incredible example to me of never giving up on something you believe in or someone that you believe in. Um, I suspect, if I ask for a show of hands and people are willing to do this, I would see quite a few people in this room that have someone like that in their life because of the expanded nature of this challenge. And it impacts everything we care about and the people we care about and the place we care about. So we need your help. We need your voice. At every level, at every engagement that you're engaged in, you can find a way to help and support this effort to remove the stigma, to make sure that people understand this is a disease and not a character flaw, to make sure your communities are providing the help and assistance to allow that dialogue, that conversation to take place without being judgmental, and to look for creative ways to continue to use our programs to provide the help either in the form of transitional housing or permanent housing, uh, or in the form of working to encourage and increase and expand the economic opportunities in rural communities so that we can get ourselves uh, in a much better place in terms of this, uh, of this challenge. There are 21 million Americans out there that need our help. And each one of them has a mom and a dad, perhaps a wife or a husband, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a, a spouse, perhaps a, 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 some children, grandchildren. I, it, it is everywhere, and it affects everyone, every level, every income level, every race, gender. There is no distinction here. This is a major problem. We're beginning to address it. Congress has an opportunity to address it even further, but it must be a battle we continue for a considerable period of time, and we're going to need your help. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions if Thank I have you, time. Sir. Thank you. If you could mic me up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we appreciate your coming and speaking about this issue. It's uh, people from rural America who are involved in housing, obviously, see more than just housing. So, Absolutely. So we thank you very much. Um, this says to please uh, thank Secretary Vilsack uh, for writing a discussion paper. In your white papers, uh, it's one of the uh, Topics we're going to break out uh, into sessions later, so uh, we wanted to, somebody wanted us to thank you for okay. authoring one of our papers. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Um, there's a headline in the Washington Post online this morning: "Rural white areas face greater HIV risk because of needle sharing by opiate, opiate addicts." Do you see any prospects for more needle sharing programs? 
It's a great question and it's a big issue. Um, and it gets back to um, this stigma that I referred to before. There is a reluctance on the part of policymakers to create programs that would encourage uh, needle exchange because they think incorrectly so that they are in some way, shape, or form encouraging addiction. Such is not the case. It is a way of avoiding unnecessary death and tragedy. So we have an education uh, effort underway uh, to make sure that people understand that these needle exchange programs, just in the same way we have an education program about prescription monitoring. Uh, it's not that we want to delve into people's private lives by getting information and allowing doctors and pharmacists to know if someone's asking for multiple prescriptions. It's because we want to be able to identify people in need of help to be able to get the help to them more quickly. The needle exchange is really all about making sure that we reduce the incidences of HIV AIDS, that we reduce the incidence of hepatitis by making sure that we provide um, a needle exchange program. So again, advocates have the ability to say, hey, this is not about encouraging addiction, it's about dealing with a consequence of addiction. And oh, by the way, while we're dealing with that consequence, while we're making sure that we avoid unnecessary death, unnecessary uh, disease and illness, maybe we could also begin the process of having a conversation in our community about this, and maybe we can work to make sure our monitoring programs are well. If there's anybody from Missouri, you don't have a monitoring program, you're the only state that doesn't have one, uh, maybe you can make that happen. Maybe you can make it happen uh, that you have every uh, first responder in your community having naloxone. Maybe you can make sure that there's a general prescription so families who know that they have a loved one who's addicted can have access to this. There are multiple ways where you can impact and help. The needle exchange program is one of them. Do you uh, see any opportunities in the new farm bill uh, that uh, we can find ways through it as a vehicle to address this crisis? Well, first of all, uh, let me begin that answer to that question with, every, with the answer that I have for every farm bill question. There are two aspects of it. First of all, we have to stop calling it a farm bill <laughs> because it's a lot more than that. You all know that. There, there are multiple chapters in that bill that deal with everything from conservation to trade to research to economic development to to uh, uh, forestry. I mean, it's an incredibly important piece of legislation, and by referring to it as simply a farm bill, I think we make it even more difficult to have the conversation we have to have, which is, what is the need in rural America? This is a bill that addresses the overall comprehensive need in rural places. And the sad reality is that far too often we begin this conversation in this town with how much money can we save? How much money can we save? Can we separate nutrition from farm programs and save money or redirect resources? That's the wrong way to start the conversation. The conversation should start, what's the need? Let's define the scope, the universe of the need. Put a price tag on that, it probably would be a big price tag, but then let's be creative about how we get to meet most, if not all of that need. We've tried over the last several years to leverage the resources at USDA to find creative ways to use our resources to challenge uh, folks who are concerned about rural America to match uh, assistance, whether it's a regional conservation program or whether it's what we're doing in economic development with uh, rural business investment companies. We're cr creating an atmosphere where we're looking at the need and figuring out creative ways to meet that need. So if you're interested in having the Farm Bill address this issue, whether it's in the form of a community facility program with greater flexibility, more grant resources, or whether it's a, uh, a housing uh, initiative that, that uh, provides more tools in terms of transition housing, or whether it's uh, additional commitment to economic development, you're not gonna have that conversation if it starts with how much money are we gonna save. So I, I'm really, really hopeful uh, that as we approach this next farm bill, that that's how we start the conversation. Because I think if you start the conversation that way, you, you, will, you will have a much stronger commitment to rural places and rural people. If you start it with let's save money and we have to save billions of dollars, I guarantee that's a much more difficult conversation and it will end up with rural America getting less than what it needs. 
a good part of the dis discussion and throughout this conference is what to expect of the new administration. And uh, I think the strategy clearly is that we're going to have to figure out a way to get our voices heard with this transition team and a new administration. What would you advise us about the message we need to send to this new administration about this crisis and how they can carry on what you started? Well, I, you know, I think, uh, first of all, um, asking the administration, and there's, a, there, there's at least one press person here today, so we'll, we'll use Bill Thompson as, the, as the, uh, the, the messenger here. It makes a difference who's in charge of this department. It, this, this is a priority place. Right? This is an incredibly important job. It's the fifth largest uh, department in the federal government. It involves uh, 50 million people who live in rural America and 50 million children who go to school every single day in this country. So that's, you know, between the two, it's probably 25 to 30 percent of the population. Together with the Department of Interior, uh, the USDA impacts and affects directly in terms of land ownership, roughly 30% of the land mass of the United States, and if you include all the agricultural space that we involved in, it's probably closer to 50 to 60% of the land mass of the United States. It's a pretty big deal. So it really does take someone who doesn't necessarily have an individual focus on one aspect. It takes someone who understands the whole portfolio of the department and who respects that whole portfolio and understands how to balance multiple priorities in multiple areas. Right? That's why I've suggested that a governor, because governors do that every single day, from my experience, a, a governor would be a good person to be in charge of this place. Now, there are people who have worked at the department before who have a better understand, good understanding, comprehensive understanding. They might be able to do so. But if you pick someone who hasn't had that experience of a broad base of juggling and balancing multiple priorities at the same time, which a governor does, or someone who has been intimately involved in the department so there's an understanding of all of what goes on there, you're going to have a harder time having that conversation. So first, it depends on who, who's in charge. Secondly, it, it gets back to that, that issue of the importance of rural America, not, not just the importance of rural housing, but the importance of the place, of the place, of the people. What I've tried to do uh, is through the course of my time is I've tried to educate the rest of the country about what rural America does for them so that they understand that when we talk about this food farm jobs bill that others call the farm bill, when we talk about that bill, it's not we're talking about something that's not, that has no relationship to, rural, to urban or suburban America. It, it definitely does. Almost all the food, almost all the water, almost all the energy comes from rural America that feeds and powers this country. So in that sense, it's a really important place. The military aspect, the fact that 15% of America's population at any point in time can have 35 to 40% of those in military service. Incredible value system that's important to preserve. So as you educate about housing, make sure that you also message about the importance of the place so that policymakers in urban and suburban areas understand and appreciate that this is important to their constituents as well as the rural constituents. And, and I, you know, I hope uh, that you're able to do, to continue that message because I think it's an incredibly important message. And it gets then back to, if people understand that, then it becomes a little easier to have the conversation about the overall need and a little easier to have a conversation about res, you know, restraining the efforts to say, well, there's a big pot of money over there at USDA, and we need more money over here in defense or wherever. We're going to take it from USDA and give it to defense. Hey, we're, we're in a sense, rural America in a, in, a, in a very real sense is the first line of defense in this country because, you know, we're a food secure nation because our farmers produce everything we need to actually feed our families. <laughs> and then they send their sons and daughters uh, to the military in greater numbers. So if you want to talk about the defense of this country, food security is just as important as a battleship, in my view. And I think we need to emphasize that a bit more so that people understand why it's important 
to deal with rural housing. Because if you, if you continue not to have adequate housing, continue not to have um, good jobs, the consequence of that to the country is $79 billion of unnecessary health care costs from an opioid and, and loss of productivity from an opioid epidemic, 28,000 people dying that shouldn't have to die, unemployment rates continue to be high, and an exodus of young people from those small towns and those rural areas, which makes it even harder to rebuild and revitalize the economy, plus greater strain on urban centers requires more commitment to mass transit and to, and to uh, more highways that eats up more uh, farmland that, that, that encroaches on uh, the ability of this country to remain food secure. So, I mean, there's, there's a connection here. Uh, and I think we need to passionately explain that to folks over and over and over and over again because it's, it's still not in the DNA, if you will, of, of, of some folks uh, who are in positions to make decisions that are important to rural housing. One last question. You just answered one of the two with your last remarks. But one last question. Uh, the people here obviously go to USDA to get assistance for their housing needs in their communities. Given this crisis, what would you tell the people who help provide housing and the employees of USDA about how to deal with people that have this problem who are coming to these organizations for housing assistance? What, what direction would you give both the organizations and the USDA employees about dealing with this community? So the, by this community, you mean uh, the, the, the opioid? opioid. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I think it's to underscore a message that I said earlier, which is that you have to be folks who don't judge. You know, you deal with this every single day. You, 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 you're confronted with a family that's struggling economically, and there are those in communities that judge those people. They say, well, you know, they're not working hard, they're not looking for a job, you know, why should we help? We have to get over that. We have to get over that. You know, the vast, vast, vast majority of people who come to organizations that are represented here that come to USDA have very simple hopes and dreams. They want their family to be living in decent conditions. They want running water. They want some space. They want enough bedrooms that everybody can have a sense of privacy. They want a decent place where they can, as a family, come together at mealtime. They want to be productive members of a community. They want to feel connected. They want to be able to build a little equity over time so that if there is a tough spot in their life, they can basically have some flexibility, that they can be part of what has often been referred to as the, as the American dream. And it starts with home ownership. For most of us, that's the way we kind of get ahead. That's the way that we've, we determine for ourselves whether or not we've kind of made it. But if we're judging those folks, we make it that much harder for them to overcome whatever the barriers are in their life. And boy, you know, it's easy for people uh, in the cheap seats to say, hey, you need to work harder. But if you don't have a decent car and work is 15 or 20 miles away, or if you've got a kid who's addicted and you're dealing with that consequence, or you yourself are addicted, or you're a returning veteran and you're just having a heck of a time readjusting to civilian life because you saw the worst of humanity in a war zone. You know, it's, it's not easy. So what we need is less judgment and, and more compassion, in my view. We need, <coughs> we need uh, an understanding that this is not a character flaw, it's a disease. And if you thought of it in the same way you think of cancer and diabetes, a lot of the barriers that exist to helping these folks fall away. A lot of the inability to have a conversation about it falls away. And if you can talk about something, then you can begin to fashion a solution to something. But if you're burying it, if you're hiding it, you can't talk about it. And if you bring it up, someone says, well, you know, just suck it up, you know, just stop drinking, just stop taking the pills, you know, <laughs> as if it was the easiest thing in the world to do. You know, I told this story uh, uh, the other day. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. I, 
this is probably not scientifically correct, but for me, it, 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 it describes something that I've been talking about here. When I was a kid, I did judge my mom. I was 10, 11, 12 years old, 13 years old. She was drinking. I thought, man, my, she was separated from my family. She walked out of our family Thanksgiving, 1963. I, you know, gosh, mom, suck it up. Stop drinking. Bring the family back together again. Be the mom that you were four or five years ago. Not the one that I have to look at in a barred room in a hospital. Suck it up. I judged her. <clears throat> when she got brain cancer, 14 years later, I was with her. She died in August, and I was with her in June. I was at my sister's house. And we had had a day where mom basically did everything that she had wanted to do you know, and eat everything she'd ever wanted to eat. Um, and, and we were just having a great time. And then something happened late at night where she reverted in character to the person she was when she was drinking. And I was, at that point, 30-some years old. I literally went to bed that night, and I put the sheet over my head because I was frightened. And it occurred to me, why did this happen? Well, the tumor was growing. And it impacted that area of the brain that no doubt was impacted when they gave her the medications in the hospital. And she came home, and she started, uh, had a craving for those medications and that alcohol, and, and it just a downward spiral. So I'm convinced from that experience, again, it may not be medically correct, but I'm convinced from that experience that this issue of disease is right. And as we learn more about the brain, we're going to learn precisely what causes this issue of addiction, why some people can take opioids and never have a problem, and others take them, and the next day, they're hooked. We can't be afraid. We can't be judgmental. We have to look at that person and understand that person is sick and needs help. And the question is, where is that help going to come from? Now, maybe it'll come from family. Sometimes not. Because it's hard. They will be, those family members will be lied to multiple times. I'm off the drugs. I'm not taking anything anymore. Well, not true. You just have to keep sticking with that person. Because, again, my mom's circumstance was a great example. You never, ever, ever should ever give up on somebody you care about, some place you care about, something you care about. You always have to keep that attitude that a better day is around the corner if we just continue to work hard. And you all know that, because otherwise you couldn't get up every single day and do what you do, which is to try to provide housing to people in great need, and to do it on a shoestring, and to beg, borrow, and steal for resources to get it done. You folks are tremendous. You're great. You need to take that spirit back home and make sure that people understand what's happening in their community and help to lead that community to a better place. Thank you all very much. Sir.